Tales from my D&D &D campaign. Previously, there's a reason troll jaws are to be avoided. They can regenerate from just the jaw. And the jaw is indestructible. Help us when we go to war against the Deluvians. In exchange, I can teach you my fighting style. We are heading back on our own. Without trolls. Hang out here till the spring. Think they'll stay? I don't know. Oh, and there's a bounty on the party. So now they need to watch out for a cadre of international assassins. But despite some misgivings, and a lot of confusion about who placed a 15,000 gold bounty on them and why, they go ahead and set up a meeting with Corin Dahl, who supposedly has strong ties to the Warbond Freedom Terrorists, even though he's a politician who publicly opposes them. They aren't exactly clear on what they want to accomplish, but they're pretty sure they should follow up on the tip. So the meeting is arranged for a halfling cuisine restaurant, and they make their way very carefully through the streets, checking every alleyway for bounty hunters. They get to this place, and it has a homey sort of wicker panel decor, and there's a bar and low tables where you sit on the floor, but the waitress directs them to a booth, and she's like, I'll just close the curtain, give you a little privacy. And the one's like, no thanks, because he'd rather have a good field of view, see if anything suspicious happens. And they order drinks and hang out for a while, no sign of this guy they're supposed to meet, and then the waitress comes back like, would you like some privacy? With her hand on the curtain, but they're like, nah, we're good. And they get food and eat and chill for like half an hour, and the waitress comes back and she's like, How about I call Fine, and close the, the curtains. curtains. So like 30 seconds later, they hear this panel slide inside the wall, so that their booth is kind of connected to a booth in the restaurant next door, and Corindal starts talking to them through the wicker paneling. Due to my position, I need to keep a certain distance from whatever you think this is. And this politician talks to them, and he words all this warbond stuff like hypothetical, and talks about how he has studied them as you would study any enemy of the peace. But it's pretty clear that he speaks for some of them. And that's the thing. The warbond has no central leadership. There are tons of groups who use the name. They all want to revoke the peace bond treaty and get back their ancestors' lands on the Laric coast, but they have widely varying ideologies about how to do it. Some of them are just talk, protests, and maybe a little vandalism, because they know it would be stupid to provoke the Deluvian Empire. Others don't have the least reluctance to kill KTs in terrorist raids, seemingly ignorant of the retribution that would come if they succeeded in drawing attention to their cause. Not that anyone comes back alive from raids into the peace bond. The party wants wants to make some connections with people who might be helpful in the future, whenever they do try to make war on the KT. They've been playing with the idea of recapturing one of the old border or coastal forts in Concord Verandi, and warbond people will be useful to man it, while giving the government of Laric plausible deniability. And once they convince Corin that they aren't government spies, he gives them the names and locations of some groups who are too zealous to deal with, some who are too minor or too pacifist to help, some who might be of use, and some others who were just weird, like the Hengal faction down south. Afterwards, they head back to the end, but they get jumped by a silent, invisible elf in full plate. This is Oric, the executioner Sturmgewehr, a renowned elven bounty hunter with more than four centuries of experience. Everyone knows elves are clinically immortal, but surviving 400 plus years while active in a kill-or-be-killed profession is a whole different thing. And he goes for Little One first with deadly precise thrusts of his glowing rapier. Little One can actually see the invisible now, so he doesn't suffer the usual massive defense penalties. But the ambush is so sudden that he is still surprised, and he gets hit anyway for a good chunk of damage. Since Invis breaks after attacking, Draven casts a buff, and Black and Little One counterattack, but Sturmgewehr is higher level than they are, and fighting defensively, his armor class is huge. Meanwhile, Angel isn't attacking at all. She's making some funny hand motion instead. And the elf is taking a big-to-hit penalty in exchange for a nigh-untouchable armor class, and this round it helps the party to fend him off without damage. It's in the third round, only after the little one manages to land a hit on him, that Sturmgewehr notices Angel's secret organization hand sign. Is this some kind of trick? What are you playing at? The bounty is off. If you don't cease now, you know what will happen. And the towering elf stands down, and the rest of the party don't know what's going on, but they take the hint, barely. He's lucky I got him back, because I could not let somebody just stab me and then walk away. But Sturmgewehr stares down Angel, and he's like, very well, but if I hear that you have collected this bounty for yourself, I will find you. And she's like, understood. 
and as he strides off down the dark alley, they catch a brief glimpse of another elf in plate mail, because Sturmgewehr is smart enough to bring a low-level cleric henchman, just in case. But they find one more thing to do before leaving the Bankton area for Corso's chasm, because Draven has wanted to seek the advice of a druid ever since their encounter with the white sapling, and I mean really white, like two-dimensional white sapling, which left him a similarly white seed. And they hear that there are actually several druids living in Falcon Peak, a town just a few hours north, so they grab their horses the next morning and run ride out, and they get there and head into the woods on foot until they find a round clearing which has subtle signs of nature magic. Subtle. And this guy dressed in a tiger's hide greets them, and he's like, I do not believe you mean any harm to me or to these woods, but I smell an arcane taint upon you all. And Draven's like, ah, is he some stupid kill all the wizards kind of druid? And the druid's like, no, I do not mean that. Even though Draven was obviously speaking out of character. I speak of the ancient curse of the hubris. It is not of nature, yet I have always thought it came about because of karma, because of their treatment of nature as a tool to be forged and used without respect to the flow of life. The hubris is something that has not been seen in my lifetime, nor in many lifetimes, even counted in the lives of trees such as these. And they're all like, what the hell is he talking about? I don't think it's the seed. Are we sure he's not just a wizard hater? Who's they? He said their treatment of nature. I don't know. The Atarans? Wait, you don't think... Astral Plague has a nice ring to it. That's what killed off their civilization. And GE7 said it had something to do with the portal. The portal that exploded? It's Space Aids! They gave us Space Aids! I'm surprised you cannot feel the effects yet. As he alluded, this guy doesn't know all that much about the hubris, astral plague, space aids, but he is able to tell them that the white seed is a nascent spirit. Once they explain how they got it, he casts speak with plants and whispers to it for like a minute, and he tells them that the seed is not a fully formed spirit, but it has a strongly good nature. New spirits aren't born very often, and they live forever, so handling it is a big responsibility. But more important to them, this druid believes it's the white spirit seed that has has been absorbing the harmful effects of the astral plague from them, drastically slowing progression of the disease. That's why they haven't been making scary fortitude saves in junk. If you wish for it to remain strong and to grow into a good spirit, I suggest you take it to places where it can absorb the spiritual energy of great triumphs of good over evil. But how do we get rid of the space aids? Yeah, he's gonna have to look into that. Like, find some old elven druids or something, because, like he said, nobody's dealt with the hubris in a very long time. But they might not know what to do, since it, you know, wiped out all the Atarans. Wait, are we contagious? And that's another good question. The best theory they can come up with is that, as far as anyone knows, only Atarans died from it. It sounds like it was very localized. It wasn't like a global plague or anything, so it's probably not contagious. In theory. Unlike the Blood Whip, a brutal virus which devastated the Three Brother Nations about 1300 years ago. Also, the party has already passed through hundreds of miles of inhabited lands, including the massive and cosmopolitan city of Bankton. If it is contagious, the damage is already done, so there's not much point in trying to quarantine themselves now. So they head back towards Bankton, but in one small town along the way, people in the streets are shouting, Ork! 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 Ork is burning down that house! And this house is on fire, like threatening to spread to other nearby buildings, but it's a solid brick home. It looks structurally sound so far. So they rush up to the house and very cautiously peer in the doorway, and the orc is standing right there in the main room, with a battle axe over his shoulder, looking unconcerned by the fire running up the walls. Hello there, won't you come in? Afraid the place is a bit of a mess. Not really fit for company, but it'll have to do. Well, this guy is a badass. But Angel makes a spot check, and she's like, He's only a half-orc. Half-orcs, as in human-orc hybrids, have a crappy life. They lack most of the legendary strength and skill of an orc to defend themselves against a society that piles upon them all of that impotent fear and hatred. And this half-orc inherited pure green orcish skin, though on inspection his other features were much more human. But Angel's like, why don't you come out here and talk? And the half-orc's like, don't be shy, come on in, make yourselves at home. I like this guy. I'd much rather fight 
outside the burning building. Oh, whatever. He doesn't think it's coming down. I'll head in. And the half-orc makes no move to attack, but as little one steps in, he gets lashed by a touch attack from the flaming spike chain of Mahran Doraj, notorious halfling assassin who is using spring attack. He strikes, then darts back up the smoldering staircase. Okay, I'm going to... Then Mahran Doraj pops back around the corner and zaps him with a psionic inflict pain spell, giving black and little one an attack roll penalty. The hell? He just acted. How can he act again? He's just that awesome. Who cares? Let's hurry up and kill him. I want that spike chain. Actually, Angel moves in and, as she had against Sturmgewehr, she gives the assassin the secret sign that, like him, she belongs to the organization. But Mahran Doraj is like, I don't care who you are, you're wanted dead. And if you're dead, no one can prove that I saw that. I'll still get paid. And Angel's like, yes, new weapon. Because now she's totally within her rights to kill and loot the halfling. In self-defense. So Black and Little One attack the halfling, and as Draven gets ready to fire his crossbow from outside, the half-orc actually drops his battle axe, and he's like, Hey, he ain't paying me to fight. I was just a decoy. And the halfling burns Little One with another flaming spike chain touch attack before tumbling away up the stairs, then charges back down and spring attacks his way past them. But when they hurt him some more, he comes back down the stairs, even though he was already back down the stairs. Secret Twin Assassins! Actually, sometime before the fight, Little One had made a joke about the infamous halfling being twins because I kept emphasizing his reputation as both fearsome caster and fighter, but he didn't realize he'd actually been exactly right until the second twin showed himself. And they fight some more, and psionic guy is forced to dimension door away, allowing Angel to flank spring attack guy and drop him with a sneak attack. So they have one twin unconscious, in negative hit points, but they don't have a new spike chain because this twin was a pyrokineticist, and his weapon was really just his flame whip class power, reshaped to look like a spike chain so the two brothers would match. It dissipated into thin air when he fell unconscious, and little one is like, your brother's still alive. If you want to keep him that way, get back here and surrender your equipment. Yeah, I want that spike chain. I thought next time someone attacked you, they had to die, little one. Eh, I think the other one has the real magic weapon. And he does. He comes back and grudgingly strips off his magic armor and his plus two compact flaming spike chain. Even though it has a ten foot reach like Angel's, this one can magically fold down to convenient pocket size, like the size of a small switchblade. And, just as his brother had altered his own flame whip to look like this guy's spike chain, Psionic Guy had a Heartseeker amulet, an item that let him make touch attacks three times a day to simulate Spring Attack Guy's psionic power. And they give Psionic Guy his unconscious twin, and he dimension doors away, leaving them with Half-Orc Guy. And the one's like, so, you're a Half-Orc, huh? Welcome to the team. And a Half-Orc's like, I'm not really much of a fighter. And the one's like, welcome to the team. But it's really time they get back to Corso's Chasm to finally turn in their three-part quest thing. Next time on Tales from My D&D Campaign. Half-Orc's like, I'm not... <clears throat> Half-Orc sneezes horribly.